Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, CIBC Wood Gundy's Ross Clark runs down the action on the major equity markets and gives us a sneak peek at gold. Doug Casey from Casey Research talks about the upcoming Trump administration and what he expects it will do. He gives his opinion on relations between Trump and Trudeau and whether Trudeau will be good for Canadian resource markets. We'll also run down the week on Canada's equity markets. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark, an investment advisor at CIBC Wood Gundy in Vancouver. Happy New Year, Ross. And the same to you, Jim, and all of your family. And our listeners, of course. Every one of them. Ross, we've been fascinated with the 20,000 mark for the Dow. Why do we care so much about the Dow and the 20,000 mark? Oh, well, the... There's always a number that the media would like to work with, and they're always looking for a headline, so this becomes a nice, easy one to uh, to have everybody uh, conscious of. Personally, you know, when as we moved, I think we took the better part of 16 years to get through 1,000. We took less to get through 10. The For, for me, it's, you know, it's less important than, than anything else because if you think about it, the stocks that currently make up the Dow are not nearly the same stocks that made it up as we went through either one of those, any of those parameters previously. So I'm, I'm more interested in, you know, what's going on with the individual sectors and maybe the price levels for where the supports and resistances will be going forward here. And, you know, with me, I love to look at historical precedents. I look for pattern recognitions. And 2016 being a, an election year was, uh, and, and not only just an election year, but also one where you had a, a non-incumbent president, one who was not going to be running. And the, you know, the typical action would be that you would have a, a poor January normally and then a corrective rally. Um, when you have a non-incumbent, classically those breaks into the first quarter are in the, oh, 10 to 17 percent bracket. So January of 2016 uh, into February, we're down about 14 percent, right in line with the norm. <clears throat> and then we had the pretty decent rally out of there uh, into the spring. You had those two hiccups through the year, the two items that really had gone from page 16 stories to page one. That was the Brexit vote and the U.S. election. The two items that really, you know, everybody was fearful of the most, and clearly the items that you are most concerned about seem to be the ones that the market uh, uh, gives least um, concern to when it comes uh, around. The page one story by ended up being the best buying opportunities of the year. Brex, uh, oh, sorry, uh, best buying opportunities of the year. The Brexit and the U.S. election. Both had uh, good oversold readings at the bottoms there. So if we take a look now as we move into a year with a new president, inauguration coming later in January, and uh, there are some really key items when we go back and look at the historicals. Um, so, you know, what we want to be looking for is the fact that We've gone from all this pessimism. We have a lot of optimism right now. So it's the black swans that we need to be conscious of. We don't know what they are, but I think it's it's important to have parameters in mind as we move through the year. And the the classic post-election year, we look at it, would be <clears throat> a correction into late February, a good rally into the summer, and then the classic pullback into November. But when we take a look closer at those the uh, the years we find that there's really three distinct types of patterns in the uh, first year of a presidential term and the when we've been in downtrending years there's been a 100% chance that the market would make a new 6 month low by the spring 
This year, we can rule that out. That's not even in the cards. But when we've been seeing higher prices, we've ended up with very, very mixed bags as far as the market's concerned. And we've put together some technical work which show the precise parameters that we want to be looking at to define whether this is going to continue as an uptrend with mild corrections, which would typically be 10% or less, or whether we're going to be looking for a deeper correction as we move into the second half of the year. Gold has played a really interesting role. We saw it uh, climb for the first half of the year. In fact, I heard some mining stocks went up 100%. Actually, I think mining stocks that went up 100 were underperformers into the summer, and then virtually all of them gave back uh, the after that uh, first 26 to 29-week rally. Uh, they gave back at least uh, two-thirds of the gains that we had off the bottom. Interestingly, you know, as we moved into December, a lot of tax loss selling took place, as you would expect, because so much money had been spent in the summer and the spring when we were up around the highs. So that tax selling clearly is behind us, and you can see the reversals that we've had here uh, in the middle of December. Gold prices got down close to the target that we were looking at at 11.05. I think we bottomed at 11.26. Uh, we've had a pretty good bounce off the bottom, but the mining stocks are really uh, coming to life. Silver, the same type of thing. Our target has been 1540. Uh, I think we got into the 1560s. And uh, we've got some really good characteristics to look at the silver and gold markets uh, over the next month and a half to two months. The probability is that we're going to try and build a bit of a base down here. And we've got some characteristics that we will be looking for at that point. Um, ideally, a tested low in the silver price, and um, we're still hoping for the 1540 to come into play. So it's, uh, from our perspective, uh, probably the worst is behind us right now as far as the, uh, the miners and the uh, precious metals are concerned. We'll be looking for basing in this first calendar quarter. Any surprise that oil has maintained plus 50 this late into the year? Um, yeah, I mean, typically you would have had uh, a nice pullback into December, early January, and then start to come to life. Uh, but when we take a look at the the years, the, I think we've got half a dozen of, well, no, actually it's probably five of these bear markets that have, have bottomed out uh, since we started trading freely in the 1980s. And so that the uh, we're now just approaching the one-year anniversary for the uh, the low in prices and you would have typically seen a high around that ninth or tenth month, a good pullback, and then the possibility of rallying in to the 17th to 19th months off the bottom. Regarding the parameters on the stock market, um, I will have a report out this weekend for my clients and subscribers of Bob Hoy's Institutional Advisors Service uh, with guidelines for the first half of the year. Ross, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money this year. And may you and your family have the best new year ever. All the best to you, Jim. Coming up, Doug Casey, next on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. Gem International is a new diamond explorer in the richest diamond producing country in Africa, located next to the fourth largest producing diamond mine in the world. International Spotlight is on an 1109 carat diamond recently discovered in Africa by a fellow Canadian junior with a proven operator and finance team. Gem International trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol GI. Visit us at gemdiamondmining.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. My guest is Doug Casey. She's the founder of Casey Research. He's also the author of Speculator, a novel in the High Ground series, available online at HighGroundSeries.com. Doug will be here in Vancouver January 22nd and 23rd, speaking at the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference. Doug, Happy New Year, and welcome back to This Week in Money. Thank you, Jim. It's good to be here. I'm speaking to you from Punta del Este, Uruguay. I'm about 50 meters from the South Atlantic Ocean right now. Doug, your novel, Speculator, has been available for a few months now. What's the reaction to the book, Ben? Uh, it's pretty good. Uh, 
in addition to our website where we offer the hardbacks, uh, most of our sales have been on Amazon because, as you know, bookstores are uh, going out of business all over because of Amazon. So Amazon's where it's all at. And uh, it's doing quite well. We've gotten about uh, 110 reviews so far. And it's generally five-star reviews. So uh, people like it. It's an unusual book. It's uh, one of the very few books that have ever been written about the mining business. But it's, uh, it's quite educational in a lot of ways. But most people like it not for that, but because it's... Uh, it's actually a hell of a good story, and the first of a series of seven reforming the uh, unjustly besmirched reputations of uh, some very politically incorrect uh, occupations. Do the stock markets in the U.S. look like they're topping? Uh, I think so, uh, but the market, from a fundamental point of view, has been overpriced for several years. And it keeps going higher. So uh, I presume what's going on now is it's an anticipation of good things under Trump. But uh, I think the time to buy something is not late in a trend, but early in a trend. And that would have been years ago. So uh, I have no real interest in the stock market at this point. In other words, uh, people might be smart to sell shares and look for better opportunities later? Uh, that's what I think. I think this is a bad time to be in the market. You know, it's it's like gathering seashells on the seashore when the uh, ocean goes out because that may mean a tsunami is coming in. So are you going to take a risk of being washed away for uh, a few seashells? It's like that with the stock market at this point. Could the bursting of the bond market bubble cause interest rates to rise rapidly, not just the planned ones that the Fed's talked about? Well, of course, interest rates are rising, and that is bursting the bond market bubble, because people don't look at these things from a historical point of view enough. And the thing to remember is that the bond market went down, down, down uh, from about the late 1940s up until the early 80s. And uh, it's been going up, up, up since the early 80s. Back then, you could get 15% on long-term U.S. government bonds. So it's... Uh, it, not, no tree goes to the sky. Nothing goes on forever. Uh, I think that the great bond market bubble is about to burst. And it could be the biggest bubble in world history because the bond market is the biggest market in the world. Let's take a look to 2017. Now looking back to the previous year, what were the highlights and the lowlights for you? Well, it's so hard to, to say. I, I'm I've got to say, uh, I predicted the accession of Trump and um, actually made a couple bets, money bets on it, and won. So that makes me happy, of course. I think it should make everybody happy because he's vastly better than the alternative, Hillary Clinton. So that's a major thing. Uh, the death of Fidel Castro was another major good thing that happened. Um other than that, uh, I'm surprised and pleased that the economy has held together for another year. Uh, I'm not convinced that that's going to be uh, the case in 2017. I think we're walking on very thin ice. Doug, have you ever met President-elect Donald Trump? And if you have, what kind of a guy is he? Uh, I haven't met him, but my impression is that he's... Uh, quite intelligent, actually, um, that most of the things that are said about him are out-and-out -out lies uh, said by swamp creatures we'd like to get rid of. And uh, sure, he's got plenty of faults. He's not a libertarian, 
but he's been in business his whole life. So I think he'll be ruled by common sense as opposed to left-wing ideology or deep state ideology, if you will, which has guided presidents for the last 30 or 40 years. So um, I'm optimistic. So in other words, Trump really wouldn't be described as somebody from the left or the right. He's somebody who looks for solutions, not idealistic uh, problems in the sky that have to be solved somehow. Yeah, I think that's right. He's a very pragmatic guy. Unfortunately, he doesn't understand economics. That's the bad news. But the good news is that I, I think his gut instincts are not bad, and he does understand business. And uh, I think that uh, he knows that the swamp creatures hate him, and although he hasn't said so, he hates the swamp creatures. So he's going to try to clean them out. That's my guess. It's certainly my hope. Do you think Ron Paul could help Trump make America great again? Oh, absolutely, because Ron does understand economics. But um, there are so many distortions that have been built up in the economy uh, over the last 40 years, since the dollar was taken off gold, that there's going to be a reckoning, and it's going to be ugly. And the thing that I'm afraid of is that uh, it's good news that Trump is elected, but perhaps it's bad news in a way, because since he's associated with free market as being a Republican and a businessman, then if this all comes unglued in the next few years, he'll be blamed for it. And uh, that'll give the swamp creatures uh, clear sailing when they're re-elected in four years, which I think is what's going to happen for a number of reasons, actually. Uh, Doug, you're not the, the first one to tell me that Perhaps the U.S. economy is going to face very many challenges going into the new year, and that no matter who the president was, they may end up looking bad because they can't solve all the problems at once. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in a way, I wish that Hillary had been elected uh, because her her ridiculous and stupid ideas that are basically responsible for all those things. She's not, but the ideas she represents are. Uh, they might be discredited, at least for a while. So um, it's it's hard to predict what's going to happen, except that, you know, the uh, scores of trillions, of hundreds of trillions of dollars of debt in the world are going to have to be liquidated somehow. Some people owe it to some other people. And uh, that could be ugly for both the lenders and the borrowers. The U.S., of course, has a tremendous debt. Could anybody solve something that's in the trillions? Uh, I don't think so, actually. Uh, I, I, I really don't see how they can do it. So that's why I expect and have been expecting a financial cataclysm. And they put it off by creating even more money, more trillions, to uh, help build the House of Cards higher to uh, shore it up. But the more they do that, the bigger the collapse is going to be. So um, I don't see any way out of it. I don't see any a happy ending in the short term. In the long term, I think it'll be a happy ending just because of the advances in technology that are now being made daily. And uh, this is actually the most important thing, much more than financial stuff. What's your opinion of the Trump cabinet so far? I'm impressed by a lot of the names. Uh, he seems, <clears throat> in his appointments, very commonsensical. Uh, and I think he's going to be a very common sense kind of guy. So it's a good thing. It's just amazing to me that uh, all these denizens of the Democratic Party, which is really just a cesspool for all the worst types of people, the worst ideologies, the, uh, the worst psychologies and so forth, it's amazing how they hate him on a visceral level uh, for no good reason. It's quite amazing to me. If you were asked, would you take part in the Trump administration? I don't know what I could possibly do, because if I was made the head of a, an agency, I would work um, earnestly and in the most forthright manner to try to abolish the agency so there'd be nothing left. Uh, just pruning back all of these three-letter and four-letter agencies is not enough, because they'll grow back. It's like when you prune a plant. 
they they grow back even stronger. Uh, you've got to pull them out by the roots and then then put Roundup where they came from. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. I wish it would. And if I was there, that's what I'd try to make happen. Uh, the consequences be damned, which is a bunch of unemployed bureaucrats, which is a good consequence, and uh, and a bunch of people that are sopping off the uh, government's tit, which would also be good to get rid of them. But forget about it. That's not going to happen. I, I'm not a political person. Which, uh, of course, uh, most of the people who have been appointed to the cabinet are not political people. Carl Icahn, billionaire, famous probably because he left the Trump celebration party to go play the stock market because he knew stocks would be going up after the election of Trump. He yeah, very smart guy. And it's nice to have smart people you know, in the administration that are familiar with business and the way that markets work. So uh, I'd say the people that he seems to be appointing are head and shoulders above anybody that the Democrats could have possibly put in office. Of course, the question people want to ask is, do you think the Trump administration will govern for corporations or for the people? Or do you have to combine the two? It isn't separate. Well, the problem is that the government shouldn't have anything to do with business or economics. The government uh, should really be just, just be there to protect you from other people starting aggression, uh, to keep you physically safe from physical aggression. It shouldn't be involved in business in any way whatsoever. So it's a false choice to choose between the people and the corporations. It's none of the government's business. I look back here in Vancouver. We had Expo 86 where billionaire Jimmy Pattison took on the job as the boss of the project for a dollar a year, he had no interest in, you know, of course his company's doing great, but he did a superior job for Expo 86. It would be hard to find any fault in it. Do you think that the billionaires that Trump has appointed will do exactly the same thing, forget about their personal interests, and do what's right for the job? Yeah, I think so, because after a certain point, these guys aren't stupid, and they realize that everything, there's a marginal disutility. Uh, when you have one dollar, that's meaningful. Two dollars, yes. But when you have a billion of them, you can't possibly spend them in your lifetime. They recognize that. So, of course, everybody wants to get wealthier. It's genetically programmed into us. But uh, they're not going to try to do what the Clintons did, which is basically uh, steal money to enrich themselves. They're way beyond that. And they're much smarter than that. So... Once again, I'm optimistic. I, I like to have rich people uh, in office because they don't need to steal, which is really uh, one of the main things you do when you're in government. Of course, I'm speaking as somebody who spends a lot of time in South America and Africa, where that's 100% of the reason you go into government is to steal in these countries. To a lesser degree, that's true of the U.S., but it's becoming more true in the U.S., as the Clintons have proved with their gigantic slush fund called the uh, Clinton Foundation. Do you think Trump's ego might be a, a positive thing because he won't want to look bad no matter what he does? Yeah, I do. Uh, anybody that gets into politics tends to be egotistical. But, um, no, I'm a, I'm a, uh, a Trump supporter. I, I think that he was unique among all these candidates. Unique. Uh, and that he really is in a position, going to put himself in a position to do something, and he will try to do something. His ego is is going to require him to do that. So, no, a good thing. Is civil unrest likely in the U.S. following the inauguration? Oh, I think so. Uh, the uh, people have been very, very corrupted by all kinds of bad ideas. <clears throat> And uh, you already see them threatening uh, to do these things, uh, horrible, horrible things. Uh, and when the economy goes downhill, and a lot of them lose their jobs and so forth, uh, that will uh, supercharge their, their nasty emotions. So, um, yeah, I think there's a real risk of that. In fact, uh, the, uh, the people on 
the side of Trump, and especially the people, the swamp creatures on the Democratic side, they don't just dislike and disagree with each other, they actually hate each other. And this is, uh, I, I've never seen or heard anything even remotely like this, except what I've read about what it was like just before the Civil War, uh, which you shouldn't call the Civil War, it's the war between the states uh, from 1861 to 65. But no, I think it's very serious. Big sociological rift in the country. Do you think people and, understand, perhaps, or, or don't understand, that a president is not a miracle worker? Uh, no, I don't think they understand that. Because I think most people I have uh, been brought up with the thought that uh, the government is a magic cornucopia that can make magic things happen. You just wave your wand and... Uh, money appears, or roads appear, or whatever appears. So, uh, no, they, everybody looks to the government. This is part of the problem. This is part of the complete corruption of U.S. society. But I'll say one more thing. I, I was just thinking about this, going back to uh, Trump's cabinet. Uh, in the Obama administration, the people on his cab in his cabinet had a grand total between them all of about five years of business experience, uh, which is nothing. They were all just political hacks. Uh, on the other hand, in the Trump administration so far, we're talking about uh, a total of 83 years. So this is going to be uh, an administration that uh, actually knows how business works, and it's going to be business inclined. And that's not anti the people. That's really good for the people. So no, I'm, I'm quite optimistic again. Do you think Hillary blew it because she forgot Bill Clinton's slogan of, it's the economy, stupid? Well, once again, there's nothing that she could do positive about the economy. I mean, all they could do is print money, which she'd encourage, and take on more debt, so they make you feel richer than you really are until you have to pay it back. So, no, I, I, if, entirely apart from the fact that the government shouldn't do anything about the economy except get out of it and abolish regulations, which is something that Trump wants to do, and I think he's going to do. So uh, this is all very good. Is Trump likely to haul Hillary into court? Uh, I certainly hope he does, because I'd like to see justice done, and I think she's a criminal personality, and the people around her are criminal personalities. So, uh, no, I, I certainly hope so. You can't let these people get away uh, with crimes they commit while they're in office. And if it can be proven in a court of law, you shouldn't let them escape. We'll have more with Doug Casey next on This Week in Monday. I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc., listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. We're speaking with Doug Casey, the head of Casey Research. Doug, do you think the Trump administration will be good for mining and mining stocks? It's going to be very good for them uh, because uh, Trump wants to see real wealth being produced. And, uh, for instance... Uh, Take the, take the pebble deposit in Alaska, which I just visited a couple of months ago. Um, that's been held up for years, and it's cost the company scores of millions of dollars in legal fees battling with the uh, EPA over pointless things, ridiculous things. Um, so um, I'm, uh, I'm very optimistic that um, mine, the mining business in the U.S., is going to do much better uh, in the Trump administration. So if you want to buy a mining stock 
if you have to choose between uh, something in Canada with Trudeau or in the U.S. with Trump, uh, you've got to go to the U.S. Donald Trump says he'll rebuild infrastructure. Is this bullish for base metals? Uh, it, it is, actually, yes. And that's going to help the mining business as well in relative terms because of the fact that I think that we're really going into a major depression. That's the negative side of, uh, of uh, base metals. Um, so I'm not, I'm not counting. Uh, in other words, I'm not going all in bullish on base metals. I'm just saying they're better than they would be without Trump because the economy is going to be a rough sledding, and that's not good for base metals. Do you think Donald Trump and Justin Trudeau are likely to see eye to eye on anything? Uh, I don't think so, no. I mean, uh, what is Justin Trudeau? He's, he's, uh, he's a spoiled little rich boy, uh, a rich father who had incredibly stupid ideas, and he, he's got even worse ideas. So, no, I don't think they're going to have anything in common at all, quite frankly. Canada and the U.S. announced that they're going to ban oil and gas drilling in the Arctic. Do you think that regulation will stick under a Trump administration? No, he'll overturn that as soon as he can. Uh, I don't know exactly what the uh, minutiae of the laws are, uh, how easy that would be for him, but uh, no, he's definitely not going to let that stand. And uh, you're not going to see uh, Obama hanging around the White House giving him advice either. Should the uptick rule be reinstated in Canada? Uh, you know, I don't think that uh, all these rules and laws that uh, we have in the markets, both in the U.S. and Canada, should be there. So, no, uh, I think that if you want to short a stock, you should do so whenever you want to, to the degree you want to, as long as you can borrow the stock and somebody will lend it to you. Uh, so, no, I, I mean, I, I really, I'm not kidding when I say I believe in unregulated markets. If you're in charge of stock market regulations in Canada for a day, what would you do to make Canada the most attractive country in the world to do business in? Uh, I'd abolish about 95% of all the people sitting around in the securities commissions uh, and abolish uh, almost all the rules that they have. Uh, it's a market like anything else. You buy and sell stocks like you buy and sell uh, things in a in a store, if you would. If you don't like the price, you don't buy it. If you don't like the circumstances, you don't participate. But you don't need a lot of uh, brain-dead bureaucrats uh, throwing uh, sand in the wheels of the economy. So that's what I do. I totally deregulate it. And Canada should do that it, 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 to uh, attract capital. Right now, all Canada attracts is, is refugees and, and welfare recipients from around the world. A great cost, uh, short-term and long-term. So a lot of things can be changed in Canada. In India, we've seen the government raid people's homes to seize cash and gold jewelry. It seems like there's a war on cash around the world. What's going on there, and can it be stopped? Well, I hope it can be stopped, because uh, when you look at what's happened to the Indian economy, uh, since this idiot, uh, Modi, uh, has uh, tried to is is in effect pulled something like eighty or ninety percent of all of the cash out of the economy, making these bills that they have worthless. Um, the same thing is going to happen. Uh, it, it means that you're going to have to run everything in the way of that you buy or sell through uh, a bank account. You'll have no privacy. Uh, it's a freedom issue, not an economic issue, although it's going to be economically devastating if they do this. But they're trying to do it. I mean, even the U.S. is talking about eliminating the $100 bill. This is disastrous. Do you buy the government's excuse you have to eliminate these large bills to defeat drug traffickers? Well, first of all, I don't see why you have to defeat drug traffickers. I mean, this is something that Everybody parrots uh, like a, a tape recorder. Uh, look, everybody, a lot of people are doing drugs. Are they good for you? Well, 
Probably not in most cases. But it's, it's, it's none of your business or none of my business or none of the government's business if somebody wants to uh, ingest substances. So um, that shouldn't be a reason. And, and then they put up other things. Oh, uh, terrorism and so forth. This is all, this is all nonsense. It's, 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 it's a question of controlling people. And you get rid of cash. Uh, this is, this is really, really serious. And they shouldn't have a right to do it. And people shouldn't argue with them about, well, as long as that's the reason or, uh, there are excuses for it. There are no excuses for it. It's purely destructive on every level. Do you see the U.S. dollar continuing to rise in the new year? Well, you know, it's the, I guess it's, the only advantage to the U.S. dollar is that it's a worldwide currency. It's recognized and accepted everywhere. Uh, I mean, this is this is the problem with the Canadian dollar. I mean, few people know what it is. The problem with the New Zealand dollar, which has been, you know, very strong, stronger currency, uh, but nobody recognizes it outside of New Zealand. Uh, the U.S. dollar is recognized everywhere, and that's that's why it's. Uh, that's why it's that's why it's strong because you know you can take it anywhere you can get rid of it anywhere and so forth but it's still just a a piece of paper look people should be buying gold and to a lesser degree silver instead of buying dollars what are your thoughts on the fake news meme well news has always been faked i mean uh, certainly since the cia has been uh, in existence I mean, all, the only thing that they produce, except the political disasters wherever they, wherever they go, are, are lies. Uh, so the uh, things that you hear on, on the major media uh, have been influenced, you know, by, by these phony thoughts from the government for many years. So it's all phony news, and you can't trust anything. You can't trust what you read on the internet, and you certainly can't trust what you hear uh, in major media either. Well, that's just reality. You can't do anything about it. But it's not a bad thing, because it make, it's going to make people more discriminating and more cautious about what they believe if they know that you can't really trust anybody. Or it'll make them find people that they find that they can trust. So this is a non-problem. And they're trying to use it as an excuse to, you know, shut down al alternative sources of information. Can the European Union be saved? I, I hope not. Uh, it, it was, it was a, a totally artificial construct. I mean, it's very nice to have uh, borders where you can go without going through bureaucracy and have be able to import and export things without duties and so forth. That's very good. But you don't need a European Union to do that. All you need is to get rid of the laws prohibiting that at borders. So what they've done, these idiots, is they've built an organization with 50,000 bureaucrats in and around Brussels. And all they do is not make things easier and better, uh, but make things slower with more regulations and so forth. So I think the EU should be abolished. But when you abolish it, they should also make sure that they don't put up more internal barriers. You don't need the EU to have a free market. You just need the absence of laws. And somehow this has gotten confused. And at worst, the EU now wants to have taxing powers and it wants to have its own military force and so forth. Uh, but fortunately, it's going to collapse and go away before that happens. Is China heading for an economic bust? Uh, I think so. I'm really, uh, the Chinese ought to be very pleased with how they've transformed their country in the last 30 years. But, uh, that said, there have been a lot of distortions created, a lot of misallocations of capital. Uh, so that, uh, sure, I think things are gonna, gonna have to be straightened out there. But that said, I think the 21st century basically does belong to China. Is real estate around the world turning into a bad investment? Uh, yes. I think the great post-World War II bull market in real estate uh, is over for a lot of different reasons. 
So um, I think once again, real estate is going to be uh, considered a consumer good, an expensive, long life consumer good, and not necessarily an investment, which is what it uh, what it's been treated as uh, correctly for uh, the last seventy years. But uh, I think the uh, tide is going out. Lithium batteries in some devices are now exploding. Will that affect the lithium market? Uh, no. I, apparently, uh, you know, they're, they're making huge advances in battery technology using many different metals and uh, technologies. So, um, but the answer is no. I think this is just a problem that Samsung had with one of their models. So uh, I think the lithium market is going to be okay for a while. But you know what they say, a uh, high-tech, big wreck. So that uh, all of a sudden, you know, lithium could go back to being just an obscure metal again if they come up with something better. And, you know, there are tens of thousands of scientists working on this every day, find something better than lithium. That's the real danger, not the problem that uh, Samsung had with batteries. Do you like green energy going forward? Uh, actually, solar energy is finally economic, and wind energy is finally economic. Now, technology is advanced to the extent that it actually is uh, usable and cheap, especially combined with uh, battery technologies, which are improving. So um, uh, I really like uh, solar. I wouldn't have said that five years ago. Has clean water become an industry, and do you think water should be a commodity or a human right? How can it be a human right? That's a ridiculous concept. I mean, if there are costs involved to supply water to people, uh, that means that somebody has to do it. Are you going to have them, uh, are you going to have slave labor so that people have water? Uh, no. So uh, water ought to sell for whatever the market price is, wherever we're talking about. It's not a human right. That's it's a ridiculous concept. I'm surprised that anybody uh, even discusses it with a straight face. It's like this concept of a guaranteed income, which is equally stupid and destructive, I've got to say. Guaranteed by who? At, at whose expense? In British Columbia, the government is offering interest-free $37,500 loans to new home buyers. Should taxpayers be supporting real estate? Of course not. And the government shouldn't uh, be involved in anything of an economic nature like that at all. So the only good news about it is hopefully it will bank bankrupt the BC government. But all that means is that they're going to come back and ask the taxpayers for even more money. So I, the only way you solve this problem is by getting the uh, getting the average Canadian to uh, to uh, throw these people and their ridiculous ideas out. Your thoughts on legalization versus decriminalization of marijuana and marijuana stocks for 2017? Well, I think I think that everything should be legalized uh, from marijuana on up. Uh, I'm not sure that there's not a bubble in these marijuana stocks. I have no particular opinion on that. Um, but um, I own a couple, but um, private companies that will be going public. So uh, I, w I wish them well, actually. What do you see ahead for junior mining stocks? I think they're very down and out, and um, this is an excellent time to buy them. The absolute bottom was at the beginning of 2016, but, uh, you know, they've gone they went up considerably, they went down a bit. Uh, I think they're going to have their day in the sun, even though mining is a crappy business. It's a horrible business, but uh, I'm not in it as a business. I'm looking at it as a the stocks is a speculation. So uh, I think this is an excellent time to buy them again. But they're not heirlooms. You don't want to hold them forever. What do you see ahead for gold? 
This is going to be a good year for gold. Uh, it, it peaked in 2011. It went down until the beginning of 2016. Uh, I think it's headed back up again because we're going to have a lot of monetary instability. Same thing for silver? Both, absolutely, for different reasons. Some of the reasons are the same. Silver is a monetary metal. Uh, the bad news is it's an industrial metal, but the good news is that it's a rather unique industrial metal. And, um, no, I'm, I'm very bullish on silver, especially because it's more volatile than gold. Oil and gas in the new year. Uh, bearish on oil and gas. I think that uh, the solar revolution is a real thing. And, uh, uh, except for transportation purposes, uh, aviation mainly, not cars. Uh, I think uh, oil is going to kind of head in the direction of coal. So uh, all this is going to be valuable, but the new technology on producing it, and I mean not just from fracking and so forth, uh, they're going to be able to make It's just a simple hydrocarbon. So it's, it's just a question of the uh, of energy and technology to create oil out of nothing, basically. So, uh, from this point, I'm bearish on oil. Unless there's a war in the Middle East, which would send it through the roof. That's the X factor. What do you see ahead for base metals? Not bullish on, not particularly. So, you know, I don't want to be in something really cheap or really expensive. And so, no strong opinions on them. Do you see a glowing future for uranium? Uh, very much, actually, because uh, it is a form of mass power generation, base load power. You, there's, there's no alternative to nuclear power. It's the safest, the cheapest, and the cleanest form of mass power generation. I, I know that's not what most people think, but most people are misinformed. Uh, and uh, in the past, uh, look, if we had an unregulated market in nuclear at this point, uh, uh, at least that we'd already be constructing fifth, fifth generation, uh, small, cheap, you know, so it's, uh, the problem isn't with nuclear, it's with the regulation of nuclear. Do you have any words of wisdom for 2017? Uh, yeah, make sure you keep what you have, because we are going to have a depression. And as Richard Russell said, and I like to repeat what he said, because he was right, in a depression, everybody loses. The winner is just the person that loses the least. So people should try to be conservative and keep that in mind. Any New Year's resolutions? Uh, follow my own advice. How can people find out more about your book, Speculator? Ah, well, that's a question that I want to. They should go on Amazon, uh, or they should go to um, highgroundbooks.com, depending if they'd like a hardback, which is uh, only marginally more expensive. And they should wait until, uh, also, they should read it now, because in July we're coming out with the second of the novels, which is called Drug Lord, which explains the uh, drug business, legal and illegal, in a lot of detail. Also a very exciting book, i got to say. Doug, have a great New Year. Well, I appreciate it, Jim, and it's been fun talking to you. My guest has been Doug Casey, CEO and President of Casey Research. He was speaking to us from Uruguay. Coming up, we'll run down the Canadian equity markets next on This Week in Money. GEM International is a new diamond explorer in the richest diamond producing country in Africa. Located next to the fourth largest producing diamond mine in the world. International Spotlight is on an 1109 carat diamond recently discovered in Africa by a fellow Canadian junior with a proven operator and finance team. GEM International trades on the TSX Venture Exchange. Symbol GI. Visit us at gemdiamondmining.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com.
Welcome back to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Going through the Canadian stock exchanges for the past week, the Toronto Stock Exchange had a high for the week of 15,434.61. The low for the week, 15,341.24. It closed at 15,287.59. It was down 40.56 for the week. The Toronto Venture Exchange, the high for the week was 765.10. The low, 734.49. It closed at 762.37. It was up 34.24 for the week. And taking a look at the Canadian Securities Exchange, the high for the week, 783.85. The low, 768.56. It closed at 781.73 up 8.52 for the week. And that wraps up our show for this week and this year. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark and Doug Casey, and thank you for listening. If you have any questions for the show or for our guests, you can email us at info at howstreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. We're back next week and next year with more This Week in Money. Happy New Year. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of How Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen.